Well, looks like you're all ready to give Bill and me the story on the hydraulic operation of this new power flight automatic transmission. Hey, Jack? Right, Cliff. We've talked about linkage and about power flow, and now we're going to see how the transmission is hydraulically operated. Hey, you boys seen Tech? Now don't you worry about old Tech. I didn't miss the other power flight sessions, and I don't intend to miss this one. <laughs> Good. Well, now that you're here, Tech, let's all gather around this bench and we'll get started. You all understand how hydraulic pressure is used in the hydraulic brake. This principle is also used in the power flight transmission. In addition, gradual and rapid buildup of hydraulic pressures are used to operate the control valves. As we go along, you'll see how these hydraulic principles are put to work in the power flight transmission. Since most of the valves in this transmission are known as spool valves, you better tell the boys what a spool valve is and how it works, Jack. That's a good idea, Tech. Once you understand how a spool valve operates and how the reaction areas help control the movement of the spool valves, you shouldn't have any trouble understanding this power flight transmission. Now, this is a spool valve. You'll notice that it has lands or sections of larger diameter. These lands open or close off oil passages leading into or out of the valve body when the spool valve is moved back and forth. In between the lands are chambers which can be used as oil passages. They can also be used as pressure areas called reaction areas. Movement of the valve can be controlled by admitting oil to one or more of the reaction areas, moving the valve against spring pressure. This will permit oil entering the valve body from one direction to be routed out of the valve body in another direction. Now, let's talk for a moment about the three major operating units in this power flight transmission. The front or kick down servo, the rear or reverse servo, and the direct clutch. Anytime the transmission is in a driving position, one of these units is in operation. Now, all three units are hydraulically operated. The main difference is that the two servos have external mechanical linkage, while the direct clutch is an internal operating device. You want to remember that the whole purpose of the hydraulic control system is to operate these three units smoothly and at the proper time. We'll talk more about these three units later. Oil to operate these units comes from either of two internal gear rotary type oil pumps. Two oil pumps, did you say? Why two? Well, there's a very good reason, Cliff. The larger front pump supplies oil in sufficient volume to take care of the needs of the transmission and converter at lower speeds. Now, as soon as the car gets rolling, the smaller rear pump begins to supply oil and build up pressure. When the pressure becomes greater than the regulated pressure of the front pump, the rear pump will take over and supply all the needs of the transmission and the torque converter. And when that happens, the volume from the front pump is bypassed to the intake side of the pump, so oil is merely circulated within the pump. The rear pump then does all the work. We might mention that it's the rear pump which makes it possible to start the engine by pushing the car. When pushed at 25 miles per hour with the selector lever in low position, the rear pump supplies oil pressure to apply the front band so the rear wheels can drive the engine. Why don't you start from the beginning, Jack, and tell the boys how oil from the pump gets to the servos and the direct clutch and how it operates them. That's a good idea, Tech. But first, we better tell them about the torque converter oil system. When you start the engine, the front pump rotates with the engine and immediately builds up pressure for the torque converter and the hydraulic control system. Now, you fellows know that the torque converter operates at 60 pounds pressure. However, the front oil pump is capable of putting out much more pressure than that. So we need some means of reducing this pressure to 60 pounds for torque converter use. And that's why we have a torque converter control valve. Right, Tech. As soon as pressure in the torque converter builds up to 60 pounds per square inch, this control valve maintains that pressure. After leaving the converter, the oil returns to the transmission through a restriction where it lubricates the gears. Then it drains down to the transmission oil pan where it is again picked up by the pumps and recirculated. And since the torque converter oil system functions the same under all operating conditions, we won't have to discuss it further. Right, Tech. 
And now, let's talk about how the oil gets to and operates the servos and the direct clutch. In order to operate these units, we need a valve which regulates the oil pressure and another valve which directs the flow of oil to the units. Right, Tech. And the valve which regulates the oil pressure is called a regulator valve. This valve limits pump pressure to 90 pounds per square inch for neutral and all forward speeds. Well, how does this regulator valve operate, Jack? Quite simply, Cliff. Oil from the pump enters the regulator valve and passes to the primary and secondary reaction areas of the valve. Pressure in these reaction areas combines and forces the regulator valve to move against its spring pressure. This action opens a vent passage to the suction side of the front pump, thereby keeping the oil pressure in the main passages to 90 pounds per square inch. Now, you'll remember we said we needed a valve to direct the flow of oil. We call that valve the manual control valve. This manual control valve is moved by linkage from the selector lever on the steering column. Movement of the manual control valve from neutral to drive directs the flow of oil to the operating units. Moving the manual valve to drive position uncovers an oil passage to the apply side of the kick down or front servo. This permits oil pressure to move the servo piston, applying the front band. That line pressure must exert enough force on the front servo to keep the band from slipping, eh? That's right, Bill. But as you begin to accelerate, more force is needed to hold the band from slipping as additional engine torque is applied. We get this additional force by putting a throttle valve in the system. This valve is operated by linkage from the carburetor throttle. Say, I get it now. As the accelerator pedal is depressed and the carburetor throttle is open wider, engine torque is increased. That's when you need more pressure on the servo to hold the band, right? Right. You've got it right on the head, Cliff. Here's how that throttle valve operates. When the accelerator pedal is depressed, the throttle valve spring is compressed against one end of the throttle valve. Compressing this spring moves the throttle valve, uncovering a passage which admits line pressure to a reaction area at the rear of the valve. This pressure on the rear of the valve then moves the valve back against the spring force, closing off the line pressure momentarily. At the same time, it opens a vent, which allows some of the oil to escape until the oil pressure against the valve is equal to the spring force. This applies additional oil pressure against the front servo piston. Incidentally, this throttle pressure varies from 14 pounds per square inch at idle to 90 pounds at full throttle depending upon how wide the carburetor throttle is opened by the accelerator pedal. That variable pressure is important, too, in its control of the transmission upshift. We'll talk about that in a minute. Of course, we want this transmission to upshift after we get underway. So, we put another valve, called a shift valve, into the system. This shift valve is a spool-type valve with pressure chambers at both ends. When the force acting on one end exceeds the force at the other end, the valve moves, opening or closing a passage to the operating units. Then, to make it operate, we can bring oil under varying pressures to the shift valve. When we start the car out in drive range, the position of the accelerator pedal causes throttle pressure to build up in the throttle pressure chamber of the shift valve. This holds the shift valve in the downshifted position. Well, if you've got your foot on the accelerator pedal all the time, how does it ever upshift? That's a good question, Bill. That's where another valve, called the governor valve, enters the picture. Before you start talking about the governor valve, somebody better turn this record over. Where is the governor you just mentioned, Jack? The governor is mounted on the output shaft and gets its oil from the rear pump. Oil routed through the governor valve will be sent to one end of the shift valve. You mean that governor pressure must be built up against one end of the shift valve to offset the throttle pressure and the spring force at the other end in order for the valve to shift? That's it exactly. And this governor pressure is controlled by the governor valve. This means that at low road speeds, the governor pressure will be low. However, as road speed increases, governor pressure to the shift valve increases. Say, I get it now. In other words, if the accelerator pressure is light, the transmission will shift at low speeds. If the accelerator pressure is heavy, 
the transmission will shift at higher road speeds. Right, my boy. When that governor pressure is high enough, you'll get a shift. Now that we got the shift valve moved, what happens next? Well, you remember, we brought line pressure to the shift valve, but it was stopped from entering by the land in the center of the shift valve. Well, now that the valve has been moved, this line pressure is allowed to pass through the shift valve. This oil then goes to the direct clutch and to the offside of the front servo. Pressure on the offside of the front servo piston, aided by the return spring pressure, overcomes the force on the apply side of the front servo. So, the front servo piston moves back, releasing the front band. Oil that goes to the direct clutch piston causes the piston to compress the clutch discs and plates, locking the clutch hub to the piston retainer. The drive, then, is through the clutch and the planetary gear sets, all turning at the same speed. Right. And when this happens, the car is operating in direct drive. I get that, Jack. But as the car slows down, how does the transmission shift back down? Well, you know, as the car speed decreases, governor pressure also decreases. So when the car speed drops to about 9 to 12 miles per hour, the governor pressure is overcome by the valve spring. So the shift valve is returned to the downshifted position by the spring. And when the shift valve moves to the downshift position, it shuts off the line pressure to the direct clutch and to the offside of the front servo. So with no oil pressure to the clutch, the piston releases the discs and plates. At the same time, line pressure to the apply side of the front servo takes over, causing the servo to apply the front band. And there you are, right back in the starting range. What about kick down, Jack? Can this transmission be kicked down for a quicker acceleration? Oh, it sure can, Bill. Actually, when you kick down, you're forcing the transmission back into the starting drive position, with the direct clutch released and the front band applied. In order to make this forced downshift, the power flight transmission is provided with a kick down valve. Well, how does this kick down valve operate, Jack? Well, first of all, let's take a look at it. You'll notice that it has a valve ball, a valve spring, and a rod. In all forward speed operating conditions, except kickdown, the kickdown valve spring and throttle pressure combine to hold the kickdown valve ball on its seat. As long as the ball is held on its seat, throttle pressure is prevented from going through the kickdown valve to the shift valve. In order to make the downshift, the accelerator pedal is depressed to the limit of its travel. The throttle valve cam assembly contacts the kick-down valve rod, moving it against the ball, unseating the ball. Unseating the kick-down valve ball permits throttle oil pressure to pass around the ball and go to the shift valve. There, the oil passes through a hole drilled lengthwise through the center of the shift valve to the reaction chamber at the throttle pressure end of the valve. When this additional pressure is dumped through the kick-down port to the throttle pressure chamber of the shift valve, it forces the shift valve to move against governor pressure. Moving the shift valve to the downshift position closes off line pressure to the direct clutch and to the offside of the front servo. So, the clutch is released. The front band is applied, and the transmission is back in the downshift position. That kick-down oil pressure must be pretty high, eh, Jack? Well, no, Cliff. Actually, it's lower than you'd think. A line restriction and a pressure bleed orifice in the line between the kick-down valve and the shift valve combine to reduce pressure to the shift valve to 75 pounds per square inch. Reduced? How come? <laughs> well... It's reduced so that the transmission will not downshift at too high a speed. This 75 pounds pressure at the shift valve is enough to overcome governor pressure up to the kickdown limit for that particular model, so the shift valve stays in the downshift position. Is there any way of checking the throttle and governor pressure to make sure they're correct? Oh, yes, there is, Bill. And you'd want to test these pressures whenever the transmission didn't operate properly. They furnish the clue to the valve which is causing the trouble. Now, here's the plug you remove so you can attach the pressure gauge to check throttle pressure. The governor pressure is checked at this governor takeoff point. And you'll find the procedure for making both of these tests given in detail in the reference book. 
And now, let's talk for a moment about low range. You want to remember that in low range, the front band is applied. That's right. Just like it is when starting in the drive range. Right, Tech. But as long as the selector lever is in low range position, the shift valve will remain in the downshifted position. So regardless of road speed, the transmission will not upshift. What prevents it from upshifting? Well, in the first place, when the selector lever is moved to the low position, line pressure from the manual valve is admitted to the throttle pressure chamber of the shift valve. Also, another oil passage is uncovered. That admits oil at line pressure directly to the low-range reaction area of the shift valve. Line pressure in these two chambers creates a force which is greater than the maximum force of governor pressure. This means that the shift valve is held in the downshift position and cannot upshift while the selector lever is in the low range. What about reverse, Jack? We haven't covered that yet. Right, Cliff. I was just coming to that. In reverse, the rear servo applies the rear band, which holds the two planet pinion carriers stationary. Now, here's how that's done. When the selector lever is moved to the reverse position, the manual valve moves, closing off oil pressure to the secondary reaction area in the regulator valve. Then there's oil pressure to the primary reaction area only. Now, wouldn't that cause pressure to build up, Jack? No, it sure would, Bill. Line pressure builds up to 250 pounds per square inch. When it reaches this pressure, the regulator valve bypasses the excess oil to the suction side of the front pump. Moving the manual valve to the reverse position also opens a port leading to the apply side of the rear servo, exposing this area to the 250 pounds pressure coming from the manual valve. When this happens, the reverse servo immediately applies the rear band, and the transmission operates in reverse. And I suppose the rear servo piston is released by its return spring when the source of hydraulic pressure is discontinued. That's right, Bill. Which one of the pumps operate to build up this pressure during reverse, Jack? The front pump, Cliff. Remember, the rear pump operates from the output shaft, so it couldn't supply pressure when the car was not moving or was in reverse. Well, that about covers the basic operation of the hydraulic system on the power flight transmission. And a fine job you've done, Jack. But remember, these are the basic operations. We've covered only the main valves. There are other valves which are designed to smooth out the operation of the transmission. They are explained in the reference book, so be sure and read it thoroughly. Well, that's about it. Thanks for your help, Tech. Think nothing of it. Just remember... The success of this new power flight automatic transmission depends on you boys seeing to it that everything is in proper operating condition. The only answer to good service is complete knowledge of what you're working on. So study the reference books on this transmission carefully. Oh.